blessed by the music ministry, both by the specials as well as the congregational singing. Man, it's been a blessing to be here already. But we're also going to get the word. So let me invite you to turn to Luke chapter 7, if you would. Luke chapter 7, we're going to continue in our um, study in the Gospel of Luke, verse by verse. This morning's sermon passage is entitled, The Mercy and the Grace of Jesus. We've been singing about that. Um, I've been having more opportunity to meditate on this the past few days, and just the singing of some of these words really touches my heart, and maybe some jet lag too, but it is really emotional when you think about God's mercy and his goodness toward us, and not because of things which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us according to the scriptures. So Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36, the mercy and the grace of God. Uh, You know, there's a man, a a young man, David Marks, who's one of the most powerful evangelists in early American history. He was born to some godly parents in Connecticut in 1805, and his awareness of God began early in his life. The incident that started him thinking about the Savior was a day when he was watching some flax burn. He had heard of the fires of hell, and as he watched the flames, he thought how exceedingly dreadful even one moment in hell would be. What would I do if the wrath of God fell on the earth, he asked himself. After serious thought, he decided that should the day of judgment come, he would descend into the well and hide there. So running to his mother, he shared his plan, but she replied, Ah, my son, the water will boil and the earth will burn. He then told her that he would run to a spot he knew in the rocks where he could hide. She said, but the rocks will melt. He was so overwhelmed with dread that he told her he would just die and and escape the wrath of God in the grave. But she replied, my child, your hope is in vain, for the dead will awake and will come out of their graves. Young David went outside and walked through the fields, pondering at length the reality of the coming day and him being unprepared for it. And putting his hand over his heart, he looked toward heaven and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That is where he escaped the wrath that was to come. He ran to Christ. He depended on the mercy and the grace of God. There was no place that he could run or hide. And the only safe place was in Jesus Christ. And so we'll see this morning that he concluded, David concluded, that Christ was the place that he was safe. We have to conclude that Christ is the place that we are safe, depending on his mercy, depending on his grace. And let me just define quickly those two terms, mercy and grace, before we start reading the text. Because in the text, we'll see a woman, a sinful woman, who will also find that place of mercy and grace. Mercy is compassion or guilt. It is withholding just punishment that is due to the sinner. Grace is unmerited and free favor. And mercy, which God shows to sinners, a sovereign God, shows to sinners with a view to their salvation in that God gave a place of refuge, a place of escape, a place of forgiveness, a substitutionary atonement that he sent Jesus to die in your place and in my place. That's what we've been singing about, the mercy and the grace of God, about running to Christ. And this is what we'll see in our text this morning. Luke chapter 7, we'll read verse 36 through 38. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. So this Pharisee is asking Jesus in the the context, the Greek word is he continually was asking Jesus to come and eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. So Jesus, we'll see here, extends mercy to a sinful woman. 
we see that she is called a sinner. She is a woman in the city which was a sinner. Either she was married to a well-known sinner or that she was a prostitute, and that's probably most likely it, that she had a reputation for prostitution. She is most likely a woman of the streets. Some in church history have confused who she was. Uh, I don't believe, as some do, that she was Mary of Bethany. That parallel passage, they say, is Matthew 26, 6. I don't believe she was Mary Magdalene, which we'll find in Luke chapter 8, verses 2 through 4. I think this is a, a different occasion. We don't know exactly who she is. Luke just names a woman of the street here. Again, I think Matthew 26, Mark 14, and John chapter 12 all record the same story, but that's not this story. This story is unique to Luke. Luke describes a different event. If you were to read a synoptic, or if you laid all the the gospels side by side and compared them all, you would see that uh, this occasion, this story, is a different place, a different time, and different people, though there are some similarities. We see the host in those other three stories, of the one story by the three gospels, three other gospels. The host in the story is a Pharisee, a leper, Simon the leper. Here we have a Pharisee named Simon who is not a leper. We see that the other stories were a different place in Judea, southern Israel. Here it is in the region of Galilee. Again, a different place, a different time with different people. And apparently this lady here, this sinful woman, had apparently heard Jesus preach and was convicted of her sin and came in repentance and faith to him as one who could forgive her of her sins. Again, if you check the harmony of the Gospels, the synoptic Gospels compared together with all the others, you'll see that this woman is different. Her tears, her humble attitude, her expensive gifts will all reveal a changed heart. Okay, at this moment in time, which we have just read about, we'll see, and we'll read about, we'll see that the, the weight of this woman's sinful past has been lifted, instantaneously lifted from her. The guilt of her life, the shame of her sin has been washed away. It has been forgiven. She has experienced the wonder of salvation and spiritual relief in the assurance of the forgiveness of her sin. This sinful woman whether yesterday, the day before, or earlier in this recorded day, this sinful woman trusted Christ. He saved her, and she has been transformed so much so that she will demonstrate her love. She wants to express her love for him for forgiveness. If you look back down at the verse, at the end of verse 36, it says, they sat down to meet. Just so you can get an accurate picture culturally here, typically um, this this was probably a feast, The doors of the house were open. People could come in and out, but only if you were invited as a guest, you would sit at the table. Short table, uh, a couch or pillows that are right next to the table. They would lean on their left, left arm with their legs angled away from the table, angled away from the food because feet are dirty. Uh, There is no running water, no public sewer system. And so that's the way that the culture would work. And The doors were open so people in the town, you know, some of the poorer folks could come in and sit behind the table as the guests and everybody who were invited were sitting down and eat. And perhaps some of those sitting on the outskirts of the walls, in the shadows perhaps, they could get food later, scraps from the table once the dining was done by the primary guests. But here, they sat down to meet. And we'll find out that this host, Simon the Pharisee, either he was careless in his social etiquette or he was intentionally rude and insulting to Jesus. And so one scholar said this, H.C. Woodring said so pointedly, he said, when God cannot get religious leaders to appreciate Christ, he will get harlots to do so. And in this story, we'll see that this woman of the streets, this prostitute, will give him the honor that is due him when the religious establishment would not, or this, at least this particular Pharisee named Simon. 
So the Pharisees' motive here for inviting Jesus to the, this feast in his honor is uh, unknown. It could be hostile. He could, it could have mean intentions, or he was just trying to be hospitable. You know, sometimes it's just the thing to do. Get the preacher, get the, get the speaker to go out with you, and it's just something to do. But here I tend to lean that this man had less than good intentions. Remember the Pharisees had been sending a, a, a watch party around John the Baptist as well as Jesus and his ministry. They were keeping their finger on, his pul- on the pulse of his ministry, and they were also seeking for things in which to accuse him. And I think that's the leaning of this Simon the Pharisee as he invites Jesus to this feast, this dinner. Verse 36 says, and one of the Pharisees desired him, the, 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 the imperfect tense there, that he kept on asking Jesus, come and eat, come and eat, come and eat. And Jesus, remember what the accusations were from the religious establishment? You know, John came and he was just a weirdo in the wilderness. He was an ascetic. And then Jesus comes and you accuse him of being a, a, a wine bibber and a glutton because he eats with sinners. So Jesus has already established the pattern, I've come to seek and to save the lost, a physician has come to heal the sick. And here he is eating also now with other sinners, even they don't think so. The Pharisees, that religious class that thinks that he is not the Messiah and are intentionally seeking for ways to accuse or to destroy his ministry. So this Pharisee Simon has this feast in Jesus' honor, supposedly. And then this woman of the street comes in, this prostitute, and we see in in the second half of verse 37 that uh, she brought something with her, a sacrifice. She brings an an expensive alabaster flask, a jar with costly perfume. It was common for relatively well-off women of that day to have a, a flask as kind of on the end of a necklace, corked and they can use the perfume, okay? It, they didn't have running water, so they had a lot of perfume, okay? There was, it was, uh, but here it was a wealthy, this was a wealthy object, an alabaster box. This came from Egypt, I think, and th- this is not a common object and not a common perfume. This was expensive. So she brings this expensive alabaster flask ready to anoint Jesus We see that she is sorrowful. Either Jesus is teaching during the time at the dinner table, it must have caused her to come to tears, or she is singing, you know, she has a reputation in town. And she must have went in incognito. And at this point in time, she is in the background, but right behind Jesus' feet, perhaps in the shadows of the wall here. And she either hears his gracious teaching or is reminded of his gracious forgiveness, which she has already received, or she sees that he's being dishonored and disrespected. His feet are filthy, and he is the one who her. So an emotional outpouring occurs. She weeps over her sin. She weeps over the forgiveness that Jesus has already extended to her. And with her tears, it says there, at the end of verse 30, or the beginning of verse 38, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. The word weeping is also used for rain. So she is raining tears because of her newfound condition and her love for Jesus. Because of the grace and the mercy which she's experiencing, tears are flowing like rain, falling upon his feet. And because there is no towel, the Bible says that the glory of a woman is her hair. She uses her glory to clean his feet with tears. An emotional scene, she is caught up in the love and the worship and the gratitude and the thankfulness of someone who's been forgiven much. If you can imagine, everywhere she went, they knew who she was. She was that woman, that high-class call girl, that prostitute. So 
she weeps over her sin, washes his feet with her tears, wipes those tears with her hair. In the end, the second part of verse 38 says, and began to wash or and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. The Greek words picture this. She keeps on kissing his feet. She keeps on anointing. She keeps on uh, wiping his feet. She doesn't say a word. Now, one word is recorded from her mouth in this text. She doesn't say a word, but her actions speak a thousand words. Such worship and sacrifice revealed her conviction that there was nothing too good for Jesus, and her Savior was being slighted, insulted by this host. And so here is Simon at the table thinking, you know, this is not right. He is disturbed about what's going on. In that day, among the people and among the rabbis, for a woman to let down her hair was a serious breach of the social moral etiquette. In some rabbinic traditions, it was equivalent to her walking around topless. This is shockingly intense for the guests in this room. And Simon, the host, begins to doubt the discernment of this, of this peasant preacher, of this would-be prophet and messiah. So he's doubting in his head here, and we go to verse 39. And now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, all this going on with this woman, he spake within himself, key words, in his mind, he's speaking within himself, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him. For she is a sinner. She's a woman of the street, a prostitute. And Jesus, answering, said unto Simon, key word there, do you see that word answering? Was there a verbal question? Every time you hear of Jesus knowing somebody else's mind, a rebuke is coming, <laughs> okay? A correction is coming. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he, Jesus, said unto him, Thou hast said, or thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace." So here we see Jesus rebuking a self-righteous Pharisee. There is some resentment building in Simon the Pharisee's head and heart. This, this Simon, Simon felt, look, something should be done here. This is not right. This Simon condemns Jesus for associating with a sinful woman who was anointing his feet. Simon felt that prophets, who Jesus claimed to be, like Pharisees, should separate from sinners. He should have just kicked her away. 
She's a sinner. She's a prostitute. She is unclean. So this woman's reputation causes him to feel uncomfortable, but both Jesus' response, her condition, reveals that she is a woman, has a specific need. The specific need is to be rightly related to the Lord, and she was. She had been. But in his mind, Simon the Pharisee, the host, says, if Jesus were truly a prophet, he would not let a sinner bestow such affection on him. But again, Jesus knows who she is. She, Jesus knows what Simon is thinking. And again, when Jesus knows what somebody's thinking, a rebuke is soon to come. And we see in verse 40 the response by the Savior. Look, I'm going to tell you a story, essentially, which will defend my position and my actions. Verse 40, it says, Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he says, Master, say on. So the context of the parable is this. A creditor, a money lender, freely forgives two debtors. One has ten times the debt of the other. The first owes him 500 pence, we'll say 500 pieces of silver. The other, 50 pence or 50 pieces of silver. And in perspective at the time, one denarius was one day's wage for a soldier or a day laborer. So if there's 500 pieces of silver, 500 pence, that's two, almost two years. Two months versus two years of work money or work pay owed. So the one with the larger debt will be the one that is most grateful. As Jesus repeats in verse 42, And when they had nothing to pay, frankly, he forgave them both. And he asked Simon the question, Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? And Simon, it's interesting that he says, I suppose. I mean, this is a no-brainer, right? But here, he's, he's starting to be tested. Well, I suppose the one that has been forgiven most. And Jesus says, look, you've rightly judged. So here's, here's the picture. The money lender, okay, rather than the money lender, the creditor, could have just thrown them both in prison and had their families pay. Squeezed it out of their families. That's what he could have done. He could have sent them to debtor's prison. But he freely incurs the debt. He cancels their debt. He forgives their debt. A modern analogy would be this. What if somebody said, hey, what's on your mortgage? 150, 200,000? I'll take care of it. And then someone else says, look, what's on your car loan? I'll take care of it. Which one would love that person more? <laughs> the one that was forgiven the greater debt. This word forgive here is, is a commonly used business term where it's the remittance, the, the, the forgiving of a debt, it's been paid, and it'll be used in the New Testament to describe our sin debt being freely paid, given uh, grace. It is remitted. Our sin has been wiped away. However, it doesn't, it's not as if the sin disappeared. It's not as if the debt disappeared. Someone took on that debt. And we'll learn that it is Jesus who took that debt, that sin debt for us. And so Simon rightly answers after the question, I suppose the one who is forgiven much. And so Jesus then just, in a sense, reams into him. Right? If you read verses 40 to 47 again. Right, 44 to 47. And he turned to the woman and said, Simon, seest thou this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water. I entered into your house, you didn't kiss me. It was a general courtesy kiss that everybody receives when coming. I didn't get that from you. I didn't get the washing of feet from you. I didn't give, wasn't given the anointing of oil from you. But this woman hasn't stopped doing this. And that's why I say to you, verse 47... Her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So here is the parable, the, the story to teach Simon. All these things. This woman had lavished affection upon him, but Simon, in contrast, did nothing. It was an insult. It was a slight. At the very minimum, it could have been just forgetfulness, but I don't think so. Jesus presses it home here. 
she has not ceased washing, kissing, and anointing me with oil, kissing my feet. So why was this? Why was this woman even doing this? The reason was that this woman was conscious of having been forgiven much. Where Simon did not feel he needed to be forgiven much at all. Verse 47 is strong. I say to you, her sins which are many have been forgiven. That's a perfect tense in the Greek. It didn't happen right there. In the past it had happened, and this perfect tense is something that happened in the past with continuing effects. Whether it was today, earlier during the day, or yesterday or the day before, her sins were forgiven then, and they're still forgiven now. And she's revealing this in her reaction, in her love for me, that her sins have been forgiven. She had already been forgiven. She is in a state of forgiveness. She has come here already forgiven with a heart of, uh, of gratitude, of thanksgiving, of love, knowing that everything that she has is worthy. Her glory, her hair is worthy of serving Jesus. Her wealth in that flask, in that perfume, is worthy of worshiping of Jesus. She has been a great sinner, but she has laid hold of great forgiveness. She has been forgiven much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Simon demonstrates little respect, little affection for who Jesus is, and thus he'll receive little forgiveness. So this, this picture in this parable, there, there are two debts represented here. Okay, Two debts represent not the same or, or amount of sin, but awareness of sin. That's the big idea there in that parable. She is aware of the greatness of her sin. She is also aware of the greatness of the forgiveness. The woman knew she was guilty of sinning against God, but Simon had no conviction of sin. You know what this is right here? Jesus is evangelizing religious people. Jesus is evangelizing. Jesus is trying to get this Simon the Pharisee, uh, a religiously conventional good person, to understand he's not good. He needs forgiveness. She knew she was a sinner. He didn't. If he could have been forgiven, if he had humbled himself and trusted Jesus, he also could experience this great forgiveness. If you don't see the magnitude of your sin, the sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross will not seem large to you. It might even seem like, why did, why did Jesus have to die for my sin? I'm not that great a sinner. But when we know the true condition of our sinful hearts and we know the price that is paid for a forgiveness of sin, which she experienced and which we can. If you haven't, you still can. And again, just to make sure you understand this parable. It's fairly simple. The debt sin, the debt is sin, and the debtors are sinners. The great creditor, the money lender, is God. Jesus' parables always invite you to identify with one of the characters or the aspects of the parable. If you listen and you identify with the man with great debt, you would view this woman with compassion. I also know what it means to be forgiven. But if you listen to this parable and identify with the man with the small debt, there's a rebuke in here. Your debt is not small, it is great. And the price to cancel your debt was great. It was the life of the Son of God. To die in your place. Pride blinds the eye to sinfulness. Pride causes you not to see your own sinfulness and your need of forgiveness. Self-righteousness is such a terrible, blinding kind of blindness and condition. I was speaking to a man about uh, three weeks ago, right in the, the church lobby, or the office lobby of the church office building here. He, he, he insisted, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, I'm a good person. I gave him the good person test. Have you ever told a lie? Yes, that's, you're a liar. Have you ever stolen anything? Yes, you're a thief. Have you ever committed uh, adultery of heart and lusted? He says, yes, but I'm still a good person. 
His own conscience bore witness that he was guilty of these sins, but blindness, he couldn't see his not good. In this parable, in his parable, Jesus made it clear that all of us are in debt to God and we are all unable to pay because we are spiritually bankrupt. But at the same time, we see that God is willing and ready to forgive the debt, any debt of sin. He's willing and ready to forgive graciously to those who admit their sin, who acknowledge their need. It's not what Jesus sees about this sinful woman. It's what Jesus sees what God can do with this woman and change her life. She has been transformed from the inside out. He looks past her past and sees a future of transformation, a newness of life. He looks forward to what God can make of her. This is a transformed life. Jesus is using her to evangelize a religiously lost good person. Here is an object lesson for you, Simon. She needs forgiveness because she has great sin. But you, Simon, you need forgiveness too. She's been forgiven much. Simon, you need to be forgiven much too. And so he says to her in verse 48, your sins are forgiven. He publicly announces to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And all the people around us, only God can forgive sins. In the Jewish mindset, Jesus was claiming to be more than a prophet here. He was God in the flesh, able to forgive sins. And we see now in verse 50, he turns to the woman and says, Thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. The other guests, again, who is this that forgives sins? But he says to her, he affirms, there's an affirmation of the sinful woman's salvation here. Your sins are forgiven. It wasn't your humility, it wasn't your tears, it wasn't your perfume. That's not what saved you or got forgiveness of sins. It was your faith. Her faith is what led to her salvation. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, lest anyone should boast or brag about it. Her great love here reflects, though, her great forgiveness. And when you see people repent and believe in Jesus, he changes their lives from the inside out. He gives them freedom from the guilt of sin. He allows them to go on in peace, true peace. The only peace that saves, the peace of God and peace with God. Literally, he says, go into peace. For now you have been removed from enmity. You've been removed from animosity with God. You have become a friend of God through the forgiveness of your sins. You now are enjoying peace with God. This is God's fundamental way of transforming people. Through his mercy, not giving them what they deserve. And through his grace, giving them more than what they deserve. This is very pertinent for our day. If you are here today and you are a religiously good person, he was a conventionally good person. If you looked on the outside, but Jesus was teaching him this, you need, you know, her sins, it was all of the flesh. It was outward external sin, but your sin, your sin is internal, and it's pride, and it will blind you from your need. You are guilty. You're a sinner. You need to be forgiven. God knows her heart, and she responds or he responds to him, her humbly, saying, your sins are forgiven. And just to make sure you understand this, it's your faith, not your works that saved you. But because you are saved, you will work. You will serve. You will live a life of devotion and love and, and peace with God. So as I close here, listen carefully. If you have been forgiven... If you've been forgiven much, it'll reflect itself in the way that you live, in the way that you love God, in the way that you love God's people, in the way that you love God's program for the earth, the church, at this time. Overflowing love is the natural response to the experience of forgiveness, of salvation. It is the appropriate consequence of your faith. If I have this faith, I will love God. I will give of myself, 
of all that I am, of all that I have, it is his. I cannot take it with me, and therefore I invest it in the future. I bless God, and I bless men with who I am and what I have. She gave it all, her glory, her wealth. And she was, again, all those who repent and believe in Jesus, if they were once extremely wicked externally like this woman, or conventionally good like this Simon the Pharisee, you still need that forgiveness. Are you grateful for his forgiveness and his salvation? If so, it'll reflect in your life the way that you live. But here I want an encouragement to whoever you are, whatever condition you are in life, the Pharisee saw this woman as wicked sinner. Jesus saw this woman as a new woman with a new life, a candidate for transformation, God working inside you know, we were in South Africa last week, and it, it, is, it would be easy for an American to go there and, and, and look at the poverty side of South Africa and say, you know what, they deserve what they get because that's what they choose. That is what Simon's attitude was. Kick her away. You know what kind of person she is. But if you've been saved, you look like Jesus looks at people and says, God can change your life. Lay hold of the forgiveness, the grace that is in Jesus Christ, and he can change that person from the inside out. That's how we should look at people who are different, who are sinful, who are not us, or who are not what we stand for. God can look at that person and save them and change them from the inside out. That's the way that we should look. So if you look down upon others because of their sin or their culture or whatever it is, change that attitude and outlook and look upon them as God would, a sinner needing forgiveness. And lastly, true faith cannot be hidden. It's going to be shown in your life, and I hope it will be by the way that you live. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the goodness that we have. Lord, we run to Christ when dogged by sin, we run to Christ seeking and needing that forgiveness. We thank you that we have that forgiveness. If you're here today and you have, need to have that conversation with God, God, forgive me. Be merciful unto me, a sinner. If you are willing to turn from what you thought would save you, whether it be good works, or to turn from sin and to put your trust in Jesus Christ and call upon him and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the best that I know how, I run to Christ for forgiveness of sin, for his mercy and for his grace. You can pray a prayer like that in your heart. Let me know. Let somebody else know. And we can rejoice with you. Take a minute. Take a half a minute here and have your own conversation with God with what you've learned today. Lord, it is with great joy that we have experienced the mercy and the grace of God in the person of Jesus Christ. It is with great joy how we can know we have been forgiven much because Jesus died for our sin. Thank you for this story. One day we will meet this woman in heaven and rejoice with her because God has forgiven her and forgiven us. Help us to live a life that is a worship, an act of worship to you. For we pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Please stand with me. Bryce is going to come and lead the singing. He's also preaching tonight. Let me invite you to come back. But um, rejoice in the great forgiveness that you have and let it be shown on your face, okay? All right, well, God bless you.